G'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be reviewing the Canon R6 mirrorless camera. Now it's going to be from the perspective of a bird photographer, because that's what I love. I've had the camera for a few weeks. I've taken, I think, over 4,000 photos. I've had a number of different sessions. So I've really put the camera through its paces, and I think I've got a fairly good idea of what it's capable of. So if you want to skip ahead to something in particular, just check the timestamps in the description. At the bottom of the video, you'll see little chapters. You can click on those if you want to go to a specific area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down this review into three videos. In today's video, I'm going to focus on what is most important for a wildlife photographer and their camera. And that is the image quality, the high ISO performance, and of course the autofocus. The second video, I'll chat about the IBIS, the mirrorless body, the, how it compares to a DSLR, and just give you my overall thoughts. And in the third video, I'm going to tell you how I've set up my camera to get the best photos in the field and probably answer any questions that have popped up from the first two videos. The first thing I want to chat about is image quality. Let's take a look at two shots I took with the R6. The same lens, same location, but these two photos are drastically different. One of them has a lot of noise, it's a little bit soft, and the overall picture image quality is terrible. If you were to look at this photo and I told you it was taken with the R6, you'd think the sensor was rubbish. So what's the difference between the two? Well, it's the light and how close I am. It's the only two things that have changed. Being nice and close and having good light has made a world of difference to the image quality between these two images. Let's have a look at some of the shots that I actually took with the R6. I'll show you the raw photo and the processed photo so you can get an idea of what the photo is going to look like. So let's start with my favourite photo and that was this red cap robin. I just love this shot. I think it's the pose that I really like. The wings are out, we've got great eye contact, we can see the red chest, we can see the red cap. It kind of just encapsulates everything that a red cap robin is. Now this was actually taken with ISO 3200 which is pretty high ISO but as you can see the quality has held up extremely well. So a lot of people have asked me to try the R6 out with more affordable lenses. Not everybody can afford the latest 500 f4 so I took my 405.6 out for a spin. I went down to a local park and I photographed Australia's ugliest bird the white ibis, or more affectionately known as the bin chicken. Luckily a bird landed nearby to me, I was able to lift up the camera and I took a number of headshots of this uh, interesting looking bird. But when we zoom in, we can see the detail, the level of detail is just amazing. And this was taken with the 1.4 converter. I really like this shot I captured of a Pacific black duck with its duckling. I just liked how we had both of these birds in the same frame. You can see that the light hasn't quite come up so it's got a sort of a dark feel to it. Now the image wasn't quite as sharp as I was like, I might have just missed focus, but I was able to recover it fairly well in post. So I was shooting at 1000mm focal length plus the 1.6 crop, and I was able to take this shot of a Jackie Winter. Now it came up really well, uh, the, the autofocus performed well with the two times, and the image quality was very good. So overall, I was extremely happy with the image quality I was able to achieve in the sessions that I've had. Let's discuss the biggest question I get asked about the R6, and that is about the sensor. The R6 has a full frame 20 megapixel sensor, and I believe it's very similar to the flagship 1DX Mark III. This is one of Canon's best sensors, so we should expect really good quality from it. But is 20 megapixels enough for wildlife? And in my opinion, no, if I had a choice, I would always go with the high megapixel option. And I'll be honest, this is probably my biggest disappointment with the camera, is just the megapixel count. You know, we crop a lot with birding. Nearly every single photo I take, I crop, and ultimately I want to be able to crop and still have a large enough file to print and to send to editors and just to use. However, if I crop too much with the sensor, the files I end up with are quite small. Let's take a look at the difference between the R5, the 5D4, and the R6. Let's pretend I've taken the same shot of the Red Cap Robin with all three cameras. You can see that the R5 with its whopping 45 megapixels, we then stop down to the 5D Mark IV, which is 30 megapixels, and then we go down to the Canon R6 with its 20 megapixels. Now remember the actual physical sensor size is exactly the same with all these full frame cameras. So the difference is the number of megapixels, or the number of pixels captured in the image. So the big question is, do more megapixels equal higher image quality and better feather detail or definition in your photos? And I don't think it does. I believe that the images fundamentally will look almost identical. So to test this, I actually took the same shot with my 30 megapixel 5D4 and the 20 megapixel R6. Same lens, same um, location, I was a fair distance away, I was about 21 meters from the subject, the perch that I'd set up. 
I want it to be that distance so I could crop heavily and see if there's any difference between the two shots. All right, this is the raw file that you can see on the screen. You can see the bird's tiny. It's a little juvenile red cap robin. All right, here's a comparison of the two shots side by side. Now I've resized the 5D4 to be the same size as the R6. Can you tell the difference between the two? Which one's the larger megapixel? Which one has more detail? Which one has better feather detail? Looking at them, they look almost identical to me and I can't really tell. So there's no clear advantage to all those extra megapixels when you're looking at the images at the same size. So which was which? Well, the one on the left is the 5D4 and the one on the right is the R6. The difference is when we look at the actual size of the images. So that's the difference. The more megapixels, the more you can crop and still maintain a big image. And that's something to consider. If you're not going to be printing large, cropping a lot, or displaying on a 4K monitor, then the 20 megapixels of the R6 is fine. Okay, so why would you go with a 20 megapixel sensor? Well, it's advertised as being extremely good at low light. So that would be possibly one reason why you'd take this sensor over another one, is just if the image quality was better and the high ISO performance was far better than a high megapixel camera. How did the R6 perform when it comes to high ISO? It's been trumpeted as the best Canon's got on offer. I was expecting a great improvement over the 5D4, so I put it to the test out in the field. When I'm talking about high ISO, I'm talking about, say, ISO 3200 and higher. So can we use those high ISOs while maintaining good image quality? I took a number of shots with the 5D4, the R6, to compare how they perform next to each other. Now I've downsampled the 5D4 to match the R6. I've got three shots to show you, so keep count. See how many of them you can tell and get right. First one's this little red cap robin. They look pretty similar to me. Can you tell the difference between the two? Maybe the left one's slightly better, and that is the R6. The right one is the 5D4. Very, very similar. All right, so the second shot is this red cap robin. A nice close-up shot. Again, can you tell the difference between the two sensors? Uh, the R6 is actually the one on the left, and the 5D4 is the one on the right. And the last one, which is the image I showed earlier when we were comparing image quality, again, very difficult and the R6 is actually the one on the right. I think looking at these examples, the R6 might have the slight edge, but it's marginal and the differences are very similar. And to be honest, I was a little bit disappointed by that. I had thought the R6 would be significantly better than the 5D4. That's a five-year-old sensor. The R6 is brand new and it's trumpeted as the um, low light king. So I, I'm a little bit confused. Um, I'm not sure why the R6 isn't a lot better, but from what I could see here, 5D4 performed very well and it was very similar. Luckily I had a good model, the uh, Jackie Winter stayed still for me and I actually took a shot with a number of different ISOs. As we would expect the image quality up to ISO 6400 is actually really really good with ISO 25600 and the 51200 the noise is very apparent and we can clearly see it and you wouldn't really want to be shooting at those high ISOs. I actually forgot to take one at 12800 so I actually took a few shots and when you look at the process photo at ISO 12800, that's perfectly acceptable to me. All right, one last demonstration with the high ISO performance of the R6. I like the framing here. It looks quite nice on this perch. And this is the final processed image. Can you tell what the base ISO is of this image? Have a guess. I took this at an ISO of 51200. So how can that be? How does the processed image look this good? Um, even though that we've got such a high ISO. And it's actually the power of processing and software, but the main one is Topaz Denoise. Now, if you've seen any of my videos, you'll know that I purchased this software and I use this to reduce the noise in my images. And you can see clearly on the screen what a difference it does make. Now, if you're interested in buying the software, it does support me. I've got a link in the description. And if you go down to the description and you wanna buy this software, there's a discount code for 15% off. So just click on the link and put in that discount code and you'll get that off this. It really is amazing software. So in conclusion, I'd be really happy using this camera up to 6400. I wouldn't really have an issue and maybe even 12,800 at a stretch, but it wasn't the great improvement I was hoping over the 5D4. So it's definitely good, but not as good as I'd hoped. The other important part of a sensor is the dynamic range. What's the dynamic range? The dynamic range is just how much detail the camera captures in the dark and bright parts of your image. So how good was the R6? Well, I took a number of shots underexposed on purpose and overexposed. Let's have a look. So as you can see on the screen, the image is almost completely black. It's really, really dark. Now, so I've put that into Lightroom. I've increased the exposure by five stops and have a look at how well it did. That image on the right there, I'd be happy to use that. Incredibly, the sensor 
has captured that much detail when we underexposed it. So I overexposed this next one by three stops and you can see on the left just how bright that image is. You know, the whites are completely blown. And when I tried to recover that in post by reducing the exposure by three stops, we can see that the chest area on the upper part of the bird was just completely void of any feather detail. It was blown, it was lost. So I did a few more tests and it, it appeared about two stops overexposed was about the limit of the sensor to recover the detail. So at two stops, if we reduce that and post, captured some detail in the feathers under the neck, and I'd be able to process that quite easily and use that photo. So what that means is you don't want to expo overexpose by any more than two stops. But if you accidentally you know, get your exposure slightly wrong, the camera sensor will still capture lots of detail. All right, the third thing I wanna talk about is the autofocus of the camera. What we wanna do as wildlife photographers is look through the viewfinder, put the focus point on the subject, the bird, focus on it, and hit the shutter and hope that the image is sharp. But we're ultimately relying on the camera to detect the subject, track it, keep it in focus and take the shot. If you'd asked me years ago, wouldn't it be amazing if the camera could track the subject you're photographing and keep the focus point on the eye? Imagine that. Well, believe it or not, that's become a reality. Canon's Auto IAF is simply amazing. The camera is smart enough to detect the bird's eye, put the focus point on the eye, and then track it as the bird moves. This is incredible. This is you know, amazing for wildlife and bird photographers because all you need to do is frame the subject, get the subject in your frame so the camera can see it. You hit the auto eye and it tracks it. Incredible. All right, so how does the IAF work? Well, it's important for us to go back to how DSLRs work first. So you can see on the 40D, nine focus points. Not a lot, very limiting, and you'd have to place one of these focus points on the subject and then focus. It's improved over the years, and the Canon 5D4 had 64 focus points. And even the AI server, you know, it's only got those points to choose from when you're trying to track a bird. So that was a big limitation. Well, the R6 has overcome that limitation with this new autofocus system. There's focus points pretty much across the entire frame. And you can see here where I was photographing a butterfly, look at all those focus points it has to choose from. So the auto IAF can pretty much track the subject throughout the entire frame. There's a focus point to pick it up all over the place. So that's why it can work so well. So how do I actually employ auto IF? Well, I use dual back button focus. So the AF on button I use for traditional autofocus and the star button I use for IAF. So I've got the two of them. So I can use traditional to sort of locate the bird and then I can push the star to activate IAF. And so one thing I really, really like about the IAF is the visual feedback you get in the viewfinder. So you, as you activate the IAF, you'll see these blue boxes pop up and they'll go looking for the bird. And then once it finds the bird, the blue box will get smaller and you'll see one blue box say on the bird's head. And then once it detects the eye, the blue uh, box will get even smaller. And then you can see this blue box on the bird's eye and it just tracks it as the bird moves. This little focus point just works like magic and tracks the bird. So you know the camera has detected the eye and when you take the shot, it's highly likely it's gonna be sharp. It's likely it's gonna be on the bird's eye and it's not gonna to jump to the shoulder or go somewhere else because you can visually see where the camera's focusing. And that is really important and a really great feature because you've got the confidence knowing that the camera's focusing in the right place. And I've got to say, my keeper rate in these scenarios is off the charts. And the only reason the shots aren't sharp is because of user error. Either the birds move too quickly or I've moved. So I've got that much confidence in the IAF when it locks on. The other major advantage of IAF is the in-field composition of your shots. What do I mean by that? Well, if you once, once the camera locks onto the bird, once it's on its eye, you can move the camera around and that focus point will stay on the bird. So you can, instead of worrying about getting the focus point on the bird, all you need to worry about is the composition. Where is the bird within your frame? Because it doesn't matter where you put the bird, the focus point's gonna stay on the eye. So say you've got a duck moving, I don't have to worry about the focus point, I can just look through the viewfinder and frame it as I like. So DSLR's maximum aperture that they could focus at was f8. So say my 500 f4, if I put a two times on it, it became a thousand f8. So my 5d4 will focus at f8. Older cameras like my 40D wouldn't even focus at f8. But if I wanted to use my 405.6, that would become an 800 f11, and a DSLR simply will not focus. But 
the R6 works differently and it does focus past f8. I think it goes all the way up to like f22. Not sure why you'd want to shoot at that. So I wanted to test this out. So I got my 405.6. I put a two times on it, giving us 800 f11, which is pretty amazing. Lo and behold, the IAF worked amazing. I was really surprised at just how well the IAF worked. Of course, the autofocus had slowed down a little bit, but the IAF still locked onto the subject and followed around and I was able to take some shots. I wasn't expecting the quality to be all that high, but you know, I was shooting in really good light. I pushed the aperture out to F14 to increase our sharpness and have a look at the, the results for yourself. Look at the shot on the screen. Um, the detail looks really good to me. If we great image quality, uh, the background's well out of focus because how close I was to the subject. This is best case scenario. So I wouldn't go rushing out buying a two times for your 400 and expect to use that all the time. And F14 is very restrictive. You're gonna need a lot of light to shoot at those narrow apertures, but it is an option. And if you've got a 100 to 400 Mark II or even the 405.6, perhaps it's an option for you. I'm so happy with the auto IAF that I don't think I could ever go back to a DSLR, to be honest. There's probably a lot of you asking, well, how does the IAF work with birds in flight? Well, unfortunately I haven't tested it thoroughly and I did have one session with some little Corellas and it's probably user error, but I didn't actually have that much success. These birds were sort of in the high, in the eucalypts and they were sort of flying above me. I was standing there trying to find the birds, push IAF, track the birds, take some shots. I did get some that were sharp, but I got a lot that were soft. The camera didn't have too many troubles picking up the bird, but it was just having trouble locking on and getting sharp shots. So I think it's more user error than the camera and I'll have to try it out with my 405.6 because using 700 millimeters handheld can be pretty difficult to keep the camera steady, pick up the bird early enough, you know, uh, get lock onto it. So, you know, I probably didn't do the camera justice by shooting in this scenario. So I'm happy to show you the shots which were soft. You can see that um, the focus points have picked up the wing but for whatever reason, it's completely soft. It just didn't focus. Um, against the blue sky, of course, it worked a lot easier because it could detect the birds and we got this sharp shot. So the auto IF is gonna struggle in scenarios where there's a lot of distracting elements. So I've tried it out. I've taken my 405.6 handheld. I've spotted a bird in this um, wattle and as you can see, it's hidden in the wattle. Very difficult for the IF to pick it out. I tried and it sort of jumped around the bird. What I ended up doing was using traditional vanilla AF to focus on the bird. And once it was focused on the bird, I then engaged auto IF and it did actually pick up the bird and stuck to it and we took a few shots. So, you know, it's just gonna be a combination when you're walking around, use traditional AF and then IAF, you're just gonna have to use a combination of both. If you saw my previous R6 video, you'll see that I have encountered some issues with the autofocus on the R6. Feel free to watch that because I go into a lot more detail. So the situation where it really struggles is say I've got a bird on a perch and I'm focused on that bird and there's a large separation between the bird and the background. If I accidentally focus on the background and it locks onto the background, the camera simply can't see the bird and it will not focus on the bird. Even if you put the focus point on the bird and you hit either you know, traditional IF or auto IF, it's not gonna pick up the bird. It won't leave the background. So what you have to do is either turn the manual focus ring to bring the focus closer and then the IAF will pick it up or focus on the ground in front of the bird or use focus preset if you've got it. This is annoying, but you can get around it pretty easily. So the comments in that video are well worth a read. Uh, and it appears this is an issue with all mirrorless cameras. It's not just Canon. It just seems to be an issue uh, with the mirrorless systems that if it can't see the subject, it's not gonna pick it up. The DSLRs definitely performed a lot better in this scenario. Of course, DSLRs had issues too, but for whatever reason, the mirrorless doesn't work as well. And that was a bit disappointing to me. I had expected it to be better than the 5D4, but in this scenario, it is an issue. I wanna share with you quickly a session I had with a dainty swallowtail butterfly. So my wife spotted this butterfly just around our house. I'd never photographed it before. So I grabbed the R6, my 405.6, I ran outside, and the photo I wanted was the butterfly on top of a daisy with a clean background. So I have to try and position myself to ensure that there's nothing directly behind the butterfly. Now, I did actually just out of curiosity activate the auto IAF and no surprises, it's not gonna work because it can't detect an eye. So it's just looking around and it really couldn't find the eye. It'll lock on to daisy or the wing. You're never gonna get a properly sharp photo using auto IAF. And you can see on the screen how we had all those focus points activated because it simply couldn't find the butterfly. So I had to use traditional autofocus. What I did is obviously look through the viewfinder, 
put the focus point on the bird, and then I hit the AF on button. And when it worked, it worked really well. It, you know, it locked on to the butterfly and I was able to get some shots. However, the issue with the background raised its ugly head. As you can imagine, got a bit of wind. The butterfly is moving and I'm moving too because I'm handheld. And when the butterfly flew to a new flower and I've moved the camera and I'm trying to acquire focus, occasionally I just get it wrong. And if I accidentally put the focus point onto the background or slightly off the butterfly, the camera just immediately is attracted to that background. It just goes straight for it and sticks to it. And it, again, it doesn't matter what I did, I couldn't get the focus point off the background. And I would actually, because I'm hand holding, it was a little bit awkward to turn the manual focus ring. I had to, using my left hand, I had to push my index finger to change the focus ring whilst holding it all steady. And then try and focus on the butterfly again and hope that I didn't miss it a second time and have to repeat that or I'd have to focus below the butterfly on the flowers, sort of get it and then up and onto the butterfly. So the focus just seemed very jumpy to me and I must admit I was actually pretty frustrated. I was thinking with my DSLR, I put the focus point on the butterfly, I hit the focus point and it's gonna find it. If it misses it, it's gonna come back to it. It's just gonna hunt until it finds the butterfly and then it'll focus on it and away we go. But with the mirrorless body, I was relying heavily relying on me not stuffing it up. If I accidentally get that background, then I have to do these things. And overall, it wasn't that enjoyable. And in this scenario, I would much prefer to use my 5D4. So the issue isn't the camera not finding focus. The issue is the camera focusing on the wrong thing. So I've got the focus point on the butterfly, but I've obviously moved or for whatever reason, it jumps onto the background. I can't get it to let go of the background to jump onto the butterfly. I have to, you know, use one of these other methods and it's just a pain it's just annoying and you know i could see me getting frustrated in the future with this so i'm not sure what i'm going to do to overcome this or whether you're finding these same issues but it's definitely something to be aware of all right well thanks for sticking with this video i know it's been a long one but we had a lot of content to cover and i hope you find it beneficial and helpful for you when deciding to go into the mirrorless system the image quality was as good as i had expected the high iso was a little bit disappointing i had expected better and the auto iaf is just simply amazing there are some autofocus issues but overall i'd much prefer to use the r6 than my dslr so a big help to me is to hit that thumbs up video let youtube know that people like the video if you want to see more of my review videos hit the subscribe button um, thanks to all the members who support the channel. If you want to support the channel directly, there is a join button next to the subscribe button for about the cost of a coffee every month. It helps me to continue making these videos. So if you've got any questions about the R6, put them in the comments below because I'll hopefully answer them in future videos. So until the next one, take care and bye for now. So this is Canon, this is arguably one of, so this is probably Canon one of, well, I don't think, it's 20 pig, it's um, in the right, and then the star button on the, and it sticks to the background and the camera. Whew, that was a mission, that was a long one.